USA. Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost inviting you to join me for Outdoor Digest this week. We have a rundown species by species of small game and big game hunting around the country. And of course, why do we hunt game? What, what is a prime motivation of hunters and of course of myself? Well, for the recipes, for the game. We always bring our game back and cook it up. We have a great wild game recipe for you. Bob Garner has outdoor headlines and commentary. Of course, Kathy Beitler's recipe and a lot more. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for the Outdoor Digest. Black bear are one of the most dangerous of the big game animals in North America, probably second only to grizzlies in the danger they pose for humans. Throughout the United States, bear license sales have been on the increase, and the demand for guides and outfitters has also been up. The top northern states for bears include Wisconsin, New York, Minnesota, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Now, the bear season in Pennsylvania, by the way, lasts only one day, and for this hunt, nearly 100,000 licenses are sold. This year, almost all the states that have bear seasons report good populations of black bear, and our Canadian reports show that some provinces have above-average populations due to under-harvesting in recent years. For my money, bear meat is tops, but it should be dressed and frozen the same day. For white-tailed deer, there's no way to predict the season other than calling it a barn burner in nearly all, all parts of the United States. From Florida to Maine and west to Texas and Wyoming, deer have shown amazing adaptability in recent years, and their populations have skyrocketed in many regions. Record harvests are expected in Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, Nebraska, and Ohio. No state is suffering from a lack of whitetails. For best chances, it's North Dakota. Over 60% of the hunters took bucks last year. Texas always produces the most whitetails, and the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta are looking to produce lots of big whitetails this season. In 1989, whitetail deer, in a nutshell, are super abundant. Deer hunters in the northern continental United States, especially the eastern half, are used to having the heck scared out of them by a noisy, close, flushing, ruffed grouse. It's a bird of the aspen stands and cedar swamps. It feeds on acorns, apples, and wild cherries, which are in pretty good supply across their range. Thorn apples attract grouse, too. And throughout their range, the 1989 prospects are very good. Minnesota is approaching its cyclical 10-year high with a 10 to 20% increase expected this year. Wisconsin says its drumming survey information from this spring shows populations are high in all but the central forest region. So overall, excellent hunting should await ruffed grouse hunters this fall. For the table, the delicate white mead of a ruffed grouse makes it the king of woodland game birds in many hunters' books. A woodcock is a much smaller bird with a long bill found in similar cover the, where you find the ruffed grouse. Now, they like wet areas because they eat a lot of earthworms, which some people blame for the stronger flavor of woodcock. But it all depends on how you cook them. Now, like duck, if they're overcooked, they'll be strong. They're about the size of a dove. They migrate like doves following flyways from north to south. Along the eastern seaboard from Maine to New York and on south, the loss of wetland habitat ca catches the blame for declining woodcock numbers, but in the central flyway, the population is holding its own. Remember, woodcock are migratory, so to hunt them, your gun must be plugged for three shells only. Look for a high water table near Aspens. That's where you'll find the woodcock. Rabbits are abundant across the United States. Well, actually, they're not all rabbits, technically. Jackrabbits in the west and snowshoes in the north are actually hares. Their young are born with fur. Now, the cottontail rabbit has young that are hairless. They're the real rabbits. Their claims to fame are that they taste delicious, especially fried, and they reproduce almost continuously. So rabbit and hare seasons are liberal around the country. In Kansas, you can hunt rabbits 365 days a year with a limit of 10 per day. Numbers are high around the country. No widespread disease outbreaks reported this year. But rabbit fever or tularemia is always a concern until the first freeze hits for a couple of days. After that, any sick rabbits will be gone and hunters can confidently prepare their rabbits for the table. And boy, are they good almost as good as squirrels. Now, I really shouldn't say that. 
But in the past couple of years, we've prepared some terrific squirrel recipes on this show, and I've grown terribly fond of squirrel. Several varieties are popular with hunters, gray squirrels in the south, uh, black squirrels, and the larger fox squirrels in the north. And like rabbits, they're terribly abundant, and if they aren't taken by hunters or hawks and owls, only about 15% survive the winter anyway. That's at least in the north. The freezing temperatures eliminate many squirrels in their leafy nests in the trees. Missouri's squirrel season opens the end of May. Kansas is June 1st. Nebraska opens early August. Throughout the country, squirrel season generally opens early and is among the last to close with a good season coming up. Now let's take a break from the good news in wildlife populations to talk about the dark side. That's waterfowl, especially ducks. Mallards, blacks, and pintails are all at rock bottom levels. Land development takes a toll each year, and the drought of 88 really clobbered the reproduction of ducks. And the decline of ducks, along with the resulting shorter seasons, reduced bag limits, and more complex regulations, has reduced the number of sportsmen hunting ducks. Duck hunting regulations are in tune with duck numbers, though, which means that they're severely cut back all over the country. Geese are a bright spot, however, and expanded seasons to reduce the numbers of local nuisance geese are found in some states. Ducks are down, though, and at least that'll hold for the fall of 1989. Now, the most puzzling wildlife species on the hunting scene is pheasants. Ring-neck numbers are dwindling east of the Mississippi, except for isolated local pockets, while the west side of the Mississippi, a number of states are standouts, Iowa and South Dakota, to name two. Kansas wasn't as good as expected last year, but it's a far cry better than any of the eastern states. Michigan's experiment with the black-neck Sichuan pheasant from China holds some promise for the eastern states, but huntable numbers aren't available yet. For dyed in the wool pheasant hunters, go west, cross that big river, and you'll find the best pheasant hunting available in the United States. Now they taste as good as ever. The problem is they're more difficult to find than ever. The biggest of America's big game, the elk, is already being pursued by hunters in some western states. Colorado offers the most available elk hunting permits. Drawings and advanced applications are required in many states. Last year's Yellowstone fire on the heels of a bad winter temporarily cut back Wyoming's elk herd. But like most wildlife, the elk have bounced back and are flourishing with high reproduction. Game laws and game management paid for by hunters' dollars for the reason we can look for another good, regulated hunting season across the country in 1989. Stephen Sunderland used a night crawler to catch this one pound, three ounce, 11 and three quarter inch bluegill. Another fish caught on a nightcrawler is a six and a half pound largemouth bass caught by Edward Seacole. Tracy McCormick caught a 17 and a half pound trophy channel cat using a pike minnow. A jigging rapala through the ice was how John Dumbra took this 10 pound, 14 ounce walleye. Casey Rose is holding his dad Carl's 21 pound, 10 ounce gobbler. It had a 10 and a quarter inch beard. Bruce Waldron was hunting the second day of the gun season and decided to put some scent out before he sat down. Listen to what happened. So I get out my little body, bottle of Foggy Mountain and I shake it up and I get my cotton ball out. I open the top and I squirted it and the top blew off and blew all over my arm. So I tried to wipe off as much of it as I could. And so while I'm wiping it off, I just happened to look up and there he was. And he was coming at me, so I better poke him before he tries to get me. You, you think he was coming after that scent? I tell you, he was coming at me at a, at a fast walk, his nostrils were flaring, and I caught him at 33 feet away. I went back this morning and measured it to make sure. 33 foot. Do you know what he would have done if he would have caught up with you? He wouldn't have caught up with me. Well, that's how he got his 11-pointer and his title of being the Outdoor Digest Trophy Deer Hunter of the Week. The North American Wildlife Foundation has launched a prairie farming program to teach farmers how to manage their land for both production of farm crops and wildlife. Many farmers have drained their wetlands, causing waterfall numbers to decline and production costs to soar. 
National Safety Council statistics are showing that accidental firearms fatalities are declining, almost 52% in 20 years. Now, that's around 1,400 deaths in 1987, the latest year that statistics are available. Waterfall hunters in Minnesota should know that there's a new law requiring all hunters in a boat to have Coast Guard-approved personal flotation devices, or PFDs. 27 Minnesota duck hunters drowned between 1976 and 86. None was wearing a PFD. And the northwestern section of the Wildlife Society has published a book on pheasants called Pheasants, Symptoms of Wildlife on Agricultural Lands. The book is the first major effort in 30 years on pheasants and habitat. It's available from the Wildlife Society in Bethesda, Maryland. And the Ohio Department of Natural Resources has begun stocking sawgai in Ohio Lake Vesuvius. Now, a sawgai is a cross between a male sauger and a female walleye. And biologists are estimating that a new Florida law requiring a person to pay $50 to keep a tarpon will go a long way to protect tarpon. According to Freddie Futch, longtime tarpon guide, it'll shorten up the length, too, of tournaments. Even though I knew Fred Bear just casually, I'm still amazed at how tolerant Fred was. Now, he didn't hunt with a compound bow, but he didn't criticize anyone else who did. He disliked hunting from trees, but you never heard him belittle other archers or gun hunters who thought differently. Fred Bear had his own distinctive style of shooting a bow and arrow, one continuous motion of drawing and releasing, yet he didn't preach shooting that way. In fact, he allowed it as how this was not the best way for most people to shoot. And that may be the best lesson Fred Bear ever gave us all, to respect another hunter's right to hunt his own way so long as it's legal and to not condemn others for the way they hunt or what they hunt. Now with hunting issues like bow hunters versus gun hunters, using dogs for chasing bear or deer, simply one hunting group's ethical views versus another's dividing hunters more and more, it's important for us to remember Fred Bear's tolerance and respect for other hunters. Now, Fred Bear may be gone, but he still has a lot to teach us. If you are harling in Europe, what are you fishing for? Harling is a method of trolling where the boat drifts downstream at the same speed as the lure, similar to drift boat fishing in the United States. Harling is popular in Scandinavian countries for Atlantic salmon and in Chile for trout. The most popular breed of hunting dog for grouse and woodcock is the English setter. But English pointers, the classic southern quail dogs, are becoming popular in the north too. Meet Rourke and Aldo. The two English pointers being fitted with electronic beepers before they take off for the woods. Bob Garner and I are joining Ned Caveney, an avid grouse and woodcock hunter, who's also the professional forester for Michigan's Pigeon River Country State Forest. He designs and supervises the cuttings and habitat improvement on this 95,000 acres, so he keeps tabs on the best bird hunting cover. Crossing the stream on this high log adds a bit of risk to the hunt. Since I'm on camera, I thought I'd ham it up just a little bit. It really wasn't that tough, but I couldn't convince Bob Garner to try the high road. So he took the low road. His confidence just wasn't there. Uh, I probably would not score well in, the, uh, in any uh, Olympic contest gymnastics. Well, the footing was... More difficult on the low road, actually, but Bob felt better closer to the ground. He made it in one piece, and we continued to hunt on the dry land. Actually, woodcock prefer wet areas, not marshes so much, but areas with a high water table where worms and other similar creatures lay under the leaves or in the topsoil. Aldo has found one here, and as the woodcock runs to take off, Aldo breaks point. Your reaction time has to be fast when hunting woodcock. The fact that the leaves are still on the trees makes it difficult to pick clear shots. Aldo is a young dog, in fact, just a pup, less than a year old. This is his first season. Good boy, Aldo. All right. Good boy. 
In the game bag goes the woodcock, and off we go to search for more. The Pigeon River country is where Michigan's elk live. You can see lots of sign. Here are a string of rubs where those big animals rub their antlers two feet higher than deer. In 1975, this country held about 200 elk. Now it's about 1,100, and their sheer numbers have caused some problems. That's why we have the elk hunt every year. Ned Caveney talks about the habitat improvement that's been done with bulldozers. These have been bulldozed. They're irregular, but you can, you can, you can <clears> see the, that it's not purely a natural edge. Mm -hmm. And we've got pretty good grass in there. About every three to five years, this is worked up and uh, reseeded. Okay, that was cut 12 years ago. At that time, we planned that this would be cut in 10 to 12 years, and it was mm -hmm. just cut this past winter. So what and that's one year's growth on that, on that young aspen. What do the grouse like better, that or the open areas? Well, they just use your open edges. This opening is mainly for deer and elk. Mm -hmm. And the aspen cutting for grouse, woodcock, deer, and elk. Snowshoe hare. Mm -hmm. And this, like I said before, until about three years ago, this aspen had quite a few woodcock in it. And now we're getting more and more grouse. And we will until it's about 20 years old, and then it'll start going down. And when this starts going down, that's going to be mm -hmm. getting better. <clears throat> you this listen a lot of areas up here? The whole forest is essentially treated that way. 35% of the forest is aspen, and you have to clear cut it. And if once we have it regulated on a 50-year rotation, we'll be cutting 600 and oh, so about this, 650 acres a year. So this forest isn't just going to grow up and fall over oh. like... Uh, no, this country won't grow up and fall over like some of the wilderness areas that aren't managed. A newly planted opening, a first-year regeneration of aspen, and a 10-year-old aspen thicket. This is what holds the grouse and woodcock. Here's a tree knocked over by elk so they could eat the leaves off. They're just as brutal on farm crops in this area, which is one reason the DNR holds the elk hunt each year. <laughs> Fast shooting, isn't it? We'll slow it down so you can see the woodcock. Catch him up. Ned reloads on the run to retrieve the bird. You never know when another one will pop out. All of a sudden, the dog locks up. Here's young Aldo on a point. For his first year, he's doing a great job. Look how steady he is. We move in closer. You can imagine how difficult hunting like this is to capture on videotape. The thick cover, fast action, we're not sure of the direction. Cameraman John Ford moves in cautiously and tries to capture it all. Second shot. Take him the first shot. Okay, bring it back here, Aldo. Come on, Aldo, fetch, fetch, Aldo, come on, fetch. I'm not the trainer of this pup, but I'm doing the best I can. It's important for a bird dog like this to locate and retrieve the downed bird. But when a pup is so young, you have to give him some help. I've got the bird located. In fact, he's lying at my feet. Now if I can just get Aldo over here. Aldo, 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 right here. Come on, come on, Aldo, right over here. Here it is, Aldo, here it is, come on, here. Oh, these young dogs. Come on, Aldo, hey, over, here. Over, here. over here. There you go, fetch him out. There you go. Good boy, fetch him out. Yeah. Fetch him out. Good boy, Aldo. Lots right. of praise and encouragement, that's what it takes. Oh, he had a solid point, he had a solid point on good. that one. Oh, yeah, he was in good form and his tail was twitching and good. he locked right good in. Good job, Fred. Oh, well, thank you. Back across the stream, you notice our guns are broken. The double barrels and over and unders are particularly safe shotguns because you can open the action when crossing fences or streams or even when you're just standing around. It's a good feeling to see other people's guns aren't loaded and know that they're safe. But the real question is, is Bob Garner going to tiptoe his way back without getting wet? Yeah, my feet wet anyway. Might as well have walked across. <laughs> if I didn't break anything. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Garner made it. We have some woodcock for the table. Another great day of hunting 
That's why we love the outdoors. William was well sent us a recipe for too much gun soup. Mm -hmm. And it was a winner in our cooking contest. Look, he calls for snowshoe hare in there, but it, really any type of small game. Right. Now, he said you, if you didn't have a large rabbit, you could use a rabbit and a squirrel or two squirrels, whatever. Pheasant, grouse, right. even odds and ends mm -hmm. of small Anything game. Anything would work in this. this. And the rabbit pieces here were pre roasted. And then we're just going to mm. put them in here so that we can get the meat to fall off the bones much easier. Couldn't you just. Just boil them off sure the bone? Could. I mean, sure you don't have to pre-roast it, No, uh -uh, no, but this one was, so that's why we're going to use it. And there it is, all off the bones. Off the bone, bone with no shot in it. No shot. you can pick off at this time. Right. And we're going to add some herbs here. We're going to add a little bit of oregano and thyme. This recipe is a real good, hearty recipe. It's got a lot of vegetables. And in fact, it mm -hmm. almost looks like a vegetable soup recipe. And some thyme, and just this is, as, as I recall, this is about the end of the spices. That is, exactly, yep. Now and we'll, then you start adding your vegetables. Yeah. And he says, um, and I have to agree, not to come into small pieces, to leave them in quite large chunks. you got fresh tomatoes and potatoes. Hmm. And like I say, they do cook down, so you want to leave them quite large. So this means you're going to cook it for a while. Right, exactly. Sort of and like carrots. It's a very colorful recipe. And egg noodles, everything all goes into one pot. It's a super recipe like this. I recall this recipe doesn't have a, a lot of moisture to it. No, nope. like I say, it's real hearty. And corn, hmm. and corn, then broccoli. Broccoli. Sounds like you could just add all types of odds and ends, anything not only you a wanted. game. Yep. I bet you Garner can hardly find fault with this one. This has got everything in it I like in a recipe. Noodles, plenty of vegetables. <laughs> Noodles. <laughs> lots of lots of good meat. This is a very tasty just just put it in the category of good food. I really like it. And you know what I got? You know what I got here, Bob? What? Oh, too much gun. Piece of shot. <laughs> too much gun. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh well, aptly named. But this is good. This is an all around uh, hearty vegetable soup, for sure. Everything in it's it. not mm -hmm. uh, the other thing too is a lot. A lot of times the soups are really liquidy. I like these. I like these that aren't, where you can really get into the mm -hmm. substance of it. Gracing the cover of the new Outdoor Digest magazine is Heiner Hertling's painting of a pair of ruffed grouse. This digest has a new look. Weekly telecast of Outdoor Digest is made possible through the cooperation of this and other public television stations nationwide. Weekly production of the Outdoor Digest television show is a function of Fred Trost's Outdoors Club, promoting public understanding of hunting and fishing, appreciation of wildlife, and enjoyment of our great outdoors. Second shot. 